It started with a miniseries about some friendly aliens coming to Earth to help us with our rat problem, and they ended up staying to help us with other problems like overpopulation, bathing, and freedom. For a while, it was massive, and then just as quickly, it wasn't. After two miniseries, a weekly series, and a reboot decades later, just what exactly was V all about? Writer-producer Kenneth Johnson had made his name in genre television. He was a writer on The Six Million Dollar Man, where he had created the character of Jamie Summers and helmed her spin-off series, The Bionic Woman. And later, he moved on to oversee the TV version of The Incredible Hulk. In the early 80s, Johnson wrote a script inspired by a book, It Can't Happen Here, about a fascist takeover of America. I mean, obviously they didn't have the benefit of hindsight at the time, but NBC didn't think that would wash with viewers. And with necessity being the mother of invention, the color of the fascist baseball caps was changed to black. Now he had mask-wearing aliens taking over. The project, now called V, was greenlit by NBC as a two-part miniseries for broadcast in 1983, as the miniseries was what all the cool kids were doing in the 80s. For victory. Johnson had a few scant weeks to write his script and prepare for production, and he would write, produce, and direct three hours of a science fiction epic. Jeez, and I get stressed when I have an appointment with a dental hygienist in three months. For Johnson, getting the right people involved was crucial. Perhaps I would enjoy the challenge. V starts with dozens of giant alien saucers appearing over cities around the world, with the aliens known as visitors appearing at the UN to extend the hand of friendship. You see Linda shaking hands. Mm -hmm. It's great. Most people are just relieved at the friendliness of the aliens. I think we've got good times ahead. But others are not so sure. The aliens promise to share cures for diseases, as well as the advanced technology needed to make a Funko Pop that actually looks like the thing it's supposed to be. Things seem to be going well for a time, but slowly it becomes apparent that not everything is as it seems. Something very strange is going on here. Outwardly, the visitors look like us. They just have an aversion to strong light, don't drink or eat around humans, and have odd voices, uh, at least some of the time. We will continue to refine the process. Scientist types are somewhat suspicious, and soon it's revealed that there's actually a so-called conspiracy against the visitors among the scientific community, which was news to the scientific community. This very quickly escalated into scientists first being denounced, then ostracized, and then rounds it up as a wave of anti-science hysteria sweeps the planet. Deja vu. A resistance forms, led by the med student and researcher Julie Parrish. But the war is just beginning. But it's TV cameraman Mike Donovan who first gets the scoop on the alien's true nature. We're pleased to meet you. The visitors have adopted human names. John is the alien's overall leader of the visitors on Earth. Diana is the ambitious commander of the mothership hovering above Los Angeles. You're trusted, respected, and attractive. Her second in command, Stephen, bides his time while snidely white anting Diana and chasing Mike Donovan's thirsty mother, while Martin proves to be an ally to the humans. Kenneth Johnson had written a layered story with so many characters that he originally didn't even bother naming them in early versions of the story shown to network executives. There are the Maxwells, headed by a scientist Robert, and his typical teenage daughter Robin, who quickly forms a schoolgirl crush on one of the visitors, Brian. He is such a fox. Mike's mother, Eleanor, is a social climber who thinks cozying up to the visitors will bring her prestige and power. If I thought I knew someone, a scientist perhaps, was being smuggled out, what should I do? Daniel is a shiftless and selfish brat who gets caught up in the world of the visitors, becoming a collaborator, while his grandfather reminds the viewers of their parallels with history. That's what I said in 1938, back in Berlin. Elias is a hoodlum turned resistance fighter. All we gotta do is just like turn up our barbecues and puff uh, <laughs> Kentucky Pride Honey Toad. And of course, we have a friendly visitor, the low-ranking technician, Willie, played by Robert Englund before he became Freddy Krueger. Willie's command of the English language, unfortunately, rates slightly higher than my own. I guess I'm not what you would call a... An ox. Oh, that's Fox, you dope. There were a lot of characters to juggle over three hours, without getting into some of the more peripheral characters. They're a well-chosen cross-section of society, and a lot of these characters are ones we will follow over subsequent V projects. I wonder if they get a royalty. 
V was teased in an effective marketing campaign and turned out to be a ratings hit when it premiered in May 1983, when the big miniseries concept hadn't yet peaked. Miniseries, that is, several movie-length episodes telling an epic story, usually broadcast over consecutive nights, blew up after the success of Roots in the late 70s and hit their stride in the early 80s as viewing events. You had any number of epic novels translated into a limited series. North and South, The Winds of War, Lace, Shogun, Shaka Zulu, etc. You couldn't turn on the TV without another massive miniseries asking which one of you bitches is my mother while preempting the schedules for several nights in a row. The three US networks were all making miniseries, and that's not factoring homegrown miniseries for viewers outside of the US. V, however, was relatively unique at the time in that it was an original story, and a relatively serious science fiction one at that. Science fiction generally wasn't working very well on US network TV in the 80s, with most new series being cancelled very quickly, or if they lasted, were barely sci-fi. I mean, a talking supercar was a science fiction concept in the 80s, but Knight Rider is hardly a sci-fi show. V, however, was an allegorical drama with sci-fi trimmings, makeup effects, a touch of horror, spaceships, and laser guns. Despite this coming out in the mid-80s when sequels were all the rage in movie theatres, V is not the fifth one. Gee, how many of them are there? The original miniseries lays out its premise with efficiency. There are the obvious parallels to events leading up to World War II, and indeed occupied countries are all present and laid on thick, like when you ask a child to apply frosting to a cupcake. For a long time, it seemed a little on the nose, but nowadays it's unfortunately more believable. The characters manage not to seem like cardboard cutouts, well, most of the time, even when most only have a few lines throughout the entire miniseries. V is well cast, with Mark Singer doing a grand job as the hero of the piece, as cameraman Mike Donovan. Quiet! That damn dragon lady can bend people's minds around. What the hell does she need a blowtorch Mike. for? Faye Grant is believable as Julie, the resistance leader with the weight of the world on her shoulders. But the reality we have to face is that help may never come. We may end up having to rely completely on ourselves. But the breakout star of V is Jane Badler as Diana, channeling another staple of 80s television, the nighttime soap super bitch, as personified by Joan Collins in Dynasty, or is that Dynasty? Of all the aliens, ambitious Diana, sorry, Diana gets the best lines and is allowed to chew the scenery. Another pass. I want to get that woman. She's a man-eater. But not like Alexis Carrington, for the visitor's real purpose for stopping by is to harvest humans for food, and then wash it down by stealing all of our water. Awkward. In addition to the water, there's another basic shortage on our planet. Food. Looking back, V looks a lot like other TV series of the mid-80s, but on closer inspection, it's really a superior piece of science fiction TV and it's very well made for the most part, well acted, and of course, the script and direction from Johnson are top notch. The vocal effects on the visitors are a bit inconsistently applied. There are the odd special effects shots that don't come off as well as they could have. And of course, there's the signature moment where Donovan catches sight of Stephen and Diana snacking on Earth delicacies. So, now we know why pet stores were listed in the latest version of The Good Food Guide. V did very well when it was broadcast in May 1983. But by the end of part two, the story had only just started gathering momentum, with the resistance having started to organize and fight back. A sequel was quickly greenlit, but Kenneth Johnson didn't stick around for long after disagreements with NBC as to how to wrap up the story, and because NBC really wanted to get to a weekly series quickly. New writers and directors were brought on board for a three-part miniseries to be screened in 1984, V, The Final Battle, a title that seems a bit of a stretch in retrospect, would show the resistance in full swing leading up to an eventual victory against the visitors. Without Johnson's guiding vision, the final battle isn't as lyrical as the original miniseries. It's slightly more sensationalist and soapy at times. It ups the action quotient and manages to juggle a lot of story threads and wrap them up in a decent way. Without Johnson's involvement, it's as close to satisfying as you're going to get without bribing every viewer with a glazed donut. What you work so hard to build, others take great pleasure in tearing down. Basically, it could have been better, but it also could have been a lot worse. Mousies. <laughs> ah. Robin Maxwell had been set up to have a one-night stand with an alien. I'd rather not think about the experience. 
and now she's pregnant. The baby is born and we get one of the final battle's coolest moments, which is then undercut by a sickly reptilian twin who looks like he's featured in a Faces of Meth campaign starring Kermit the Frog. The surviving star child, Elizabeth, is a hybrid of a human mother and an alien father, which means by default, she also inherits ill-defined magical powers and also grows from an infant to a preteen in about a week and a half. Donovan and Julia are now a thing, Donovan and Julie now have a rival for the leadership of the Resistance, with Michael Ironside's mercenary Ham Tyler getting all of the edgiest dialogue. This lady cannot be trusted. She thinks like a lizard now. Whoa, wait a minute. It was the 80s. It was a different time. Herpetophobia was rife, at least until people looked up what the word meant and realised it referred to reptiles and not cold sores. The Resistance have a few small victories along the way, such as co-opting a photo op and revealing the visitors' true nature to the public. The visitors are not our friends! They've come to rape our planet and kill us! They are not who they appear to be! This is not science fiction! While the original miniseries wasn't always as subtle as it could be, the final battle jettisons analogies and suggestion for outright sledgehammer plotting and characterization. The final battle has a lot of soapy scenes of people having heart-to-heart -heart talks against a sunset, but also lots of shirtless former Beastmaster Mike Donovan. A new character, Father Andrew, appears, and for a while he goes against the grain as a cool padre who'd already been in several war zones. But before you get too complacent, he makes the mistake of trying to trust the aliens by taking space baby Elizabeth to Diana in the hopes of that somehow even after the aliens subjugated the humans, then ate the humans, and then planned to steal all of the water, that even after all of that, that somehow just showing this space child will make the visitors stop and think. You've shown me that I have vulnerabilities, and I won't allow them to exist anymore. In a nod to Diana being a reaction to characters from Dallas and Dynasty, 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 she now has a rival in the form of her boss, Pamela, and very quickly starts to lose her grip on power, until she decides to take it back with the ultimate 360 review. You rely on cunning, intrigue. I prefer the direct approach. The humans have developed an effective biological weapon against the visitors, the red dust, which kills them almost instantly. In the final push, the resistance spread the red dust in balloons and managed to take over the LA mothership, which Diana intends to use as a massive weapon to destroy all life on Earth. But then, you son of a bitch v the final battle. Okay, so it wasn't as good as the first miniseries, but it was still mostly decent. We're the last shot before the buzzer. The final 90 minutes see all manner of nasty characters getting their comeuppance. What are you going to do with me, Stephen? Send you where you'll serve as well, on a serving platter. No! Stephen is well and truly dusted, but Diana lives to see another day. NBC broadcast the three parts of the final battle in May 1984. And again, it was successful enough to continue the story, now with a weekly series greenlit for October of that year. And that's where, like Henry Blake's plane, things really spun out of control. Cages are very unpleasant, aren't they? My options seem limited. V the series picks up the story a year after the events of the final battle. The resistance has moved on. But when the red dust proves to be useless in warmer climates, the visitors regroup to retake Earth with a ground assault. On the Brazilian front, resistance leaders suffered a grave setback with the capture and execution of several high-ranking leaders in the Mato Grosso Battalion. In Los Angeles, ambitious businessman Nathan Bates engineers a takeover of the city by signing a truce with the visitors and declares it an open city, with the visitors and humans coexisting uneasily for a bit. So you were bluffing? Oh, no. I was playing to win. The relationship between Mike and Julie has been scaled back, with them just being comrades and friends rather than a couple, since TV producers at the time generally wanted their leads to be available for random romances for odd episodes here and there, apart from the visitors, who seem to have taken horny pills. Along with an always welcome Lane Smith as Bates, new characters include Bates' son Kyle, who joins the Resistance and takes the role of second string teen heartthrob while Diana has a new rival in the form of ambitious Lydia. Robin's daughter, the star child Elizabeth, is now aged up to be a teenager. Good. And finally, Martin's twin brother Philip shows up towards the end. Well, perhaps you're suggesting that I'm part of the fifth column. Of course not, Commander. That would be grounds for our immediate court-martial. 
LA has made a sort of neutral place that would mimic the tensions of Casablanca, even down to having a restaurant featured heavily in early episodes. They even cribbed one of Casablanca's best known scenes. That noise. Mm. That is our national anthem. Willie is still around to provide context for various parts of alien society created for this series, including a forbidden religion. May I guard your body? Uh... But mostly he's just there to be a comedy waiter mangling the English language. Yes, yes, it is always best not to jump to contusions. Basically, Manuel from Faulty Towers. Elizabeth has a pornographic memory. Photographic. V the series features the weirdest love triangle I can think of. Having aged up Elizabeth the star child, so this, let's be charitable and say two year old girl. She's a baby, Mike, she needs her mother. Looks like a 16 year old teenager. The series sets up a love triangle with Elizabeth's mum, Robin, and Kyle Bates. And we touched only for a moment. But, but as Robin was also a teenage mother, it's entirely possible that Kyle's situation is some form of double jailbait. It's not just a spring break at Miami Beach nightmare, but like Gilmore Girls fan fiction where Rory slept with Luke. In the series, the visitors don't need to keep wearing the human skins. But, for whatever kinky, fetishistic reasons, they almost always do. This means we get lots of cool scenes of injured or dying visitors ripping their skin to show their scales. But it does mean we have silly scenes of visitors sharing intimate moments with each other while still cosplaying as humans. I wonder what's going on. Oh, that Diana, always up to something. The budget did allow for the odd scene of a visitor going around sans sapien skin, but it's a budgetary conceit this series was always going to have to swallow. It does mean we get lots of Jane Badler strutting and pouting with glitter in her hair and 80s style power dressing. If all goes well, I may have to make you my personal adjutant. Why? But the series, it has to be said, wasn't really that good. It's watchable, but also often laughable and more than a bit cheesy. The production standards and acting have taken a nosedive. But even worse, the writing and plotting is just so very ordinary. There are lots of fun shootouts and fistfights for the kids, but it's all in service of plots so dumb that it seems worlds away from the lyricism of the original miniseries. And something clearly wasn't working as characters are written out so much by the time we get to a very obvious mid-season retooling, the cast have been thinned out considerably. They arrived in 50 motherships, offering their friendship and advanced technology. Gone are Elias, Robin, Ham Tyler and Nathan Bates and there was now an increased focus on the rivalry between Lydia and Diana, which got more and more ridiculous as the show headed toward oblivion. V the series, unlike many of its action-adventure contemporaries, does feature an ongoing storyline and cliffhangers. It's sort of serialized, like Dynasty, 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 but not so much that it's hard to pick up if you missed an episode. It's an egg. Towards the end of the series, you could almost smell the producer's desperation with Lydia and Diana's rivalry taking the series in an even more over-the-top direction. And not to mention the increasingly sillier costumes and big hair. It's the mid-80s and Diana and Lydia's hair just gets bigger and bigger, possibly because Diana's eventual plan for retaking the Earth was just to cover the land masses with her coiffure. V the series is not as family-friendly as you'd expect. Unlike a show like The A-Team, which took great care to have people spraying automatic weapon fire all over the place with almost no one ever being killed, in V the series, main characters die, sometimes quite horribly. One episode was even rejected by NBC due to violence, which, if you ever watch the show now, you'll understand why some characters are introduced to each other multiple times. What's your name? Kyle Bates. The writing was on the wall, and the show was cancelled after 19 episodes, leaving the season finale unfilmed, which meant the entire endeavor ended on a sort of a cliffhanger. Where's Kyle? Well, he was here a moment ago. Well, you don't think he... he stowed away. V the series is inessential viewing for most people, like sugar-free chocolate. It's watchable, but it's not great. It's nice to see some favorite characters like Julie, Mike, Tyler, Willie, and Diana, but there's not a lot of great material for any of them. A bit like a comedian trying to get a tight five out of leprosy. It's a descent into melodrama mixed in with action adventure with no clear creative vision and it barely holds together like a five-year-old Alfa Romeo. 
V the series is, yeah, sort of entertaining if you watch the first two miniseries and you need to see more of this universe. But it's definitely a lesser show in pretty much every way you can think of. Like when you're excited to get three letters in the post, V the miniseries is a big tax refund check. V the final battle is $10 your aunt has sent you for your birthday. And V the series is the third envelope, a letter from your doctor reminding you that you're overdue for a colonoscopy. After the series ended in March of 1985, various attempts to continue or reboot V had been made by different creative people, but nothing clicked. Then in 2009, V was back on network TV, on the ABC network. But at the time, I wasn't interested in sampling it, mainly because of the terrible habit of network television cancelling anything remotely interesting. But now I have seen it, and... The new V has the aliens as reptiles in cloned human skin, wearing tailored suits in muted colours, presenting a cult-like alien culture led by Anna. The alien's fifth column has been causing issues for the Vs as they're known in the show, and like the 80s weekly series, there's a lot more focus on the visitor's internal politics. They're still rat-eating, an alien-human hybrid, and a human resistance, now led by a priest and an FBI agent. And there are a few appearances from original V favourites despite Warner Brothers at one point trying to remove creator Kenneth Johnson's credit. It's slick and there's a decent effects budget, but with a liberal use of virtual sets, it can come across as clinical and soulless, like someone trying to sell you cryptocurrency before, during and after an exorcism. V the reboot, or to save time, V boot, is a different enough take on the source material and it's reasonably watchable despite it only lasting two short seasons. Even then there's a clip show in there somewhere, but by now, I think we're done. You see them as they really are. Reptiles. <laughs> they must be defeated. <laughs> I still love those first two miniseries, particularly the first. They're exciting, well-made, well-acted and tell a compelling story with interesting characters. We've also managed to get this far without making too many lizard puns. So that's it for our look at V and its cast of characters such as Gecko Gal Diana, Stephen the Skink, Willie the Whiptail, Lizard Lips Lydia. Honestly, I could do this all day. I want this victory to be absolutely decisive. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below or check out some of our other videos.